out. Here we go. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Don't say anything weird from here. Yeah. It will be recorded. And hi, Diane Becker. Oh, wow. Nice day, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Jean. Let's see who else. Up. There's Michelle. I see Michelle and some fiery red. Friday, fiery red day with Michelle. Okay. Ba, ba, ba. Oh, Peter Gorse. I, who, I really think, Peter, you've been here. Like every time I send out the um, reminder emails, I'm like, Peter Gorse is here again. Peter Gorse has been here for so many Feedback Fridays. That's good. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> ah, you guys are funny. I actually miss doing this every every week. When we skip a week. Missed you last feel, week. Yeah, it doesn't feel right, right? Okay, uh, Kathy, I like your new hairdo. Oh, thank you. Looking, looking cool, looking chill. Yeah, I slept on oh. it funny, so it's sort of. <laughs> it's you got a little, little, little wing there. Yeah, it's doing its own thing. I just like, okay, <laughs> It took fine. like 20 years off you. What? Yeah, cute. Yeah, I mean, like it, your, it had like been a long time. Oh, here's Janelle. Janelle's here. Look at you guys have got the same color hair almost. I'm trying to become Kathy. That is all I want to do in life. All you have I to do is to... keep aging and your hair does its own thing. Here? Yeah. Any filmmakers, I'm, I'd love to pitch you on a um, documentary I'd like to create called Becoming Kathy Hattori. No, no, no. Yeah. Yes. N O. I would like to have my interpretation on that. It's yeah. my decision. <laughs> There'll be all those like you artificial can't do anything stills from, from where you are. <laughs> I'm powerless. All right. You're powerless over me. How are we doing, Amy? You want We're me to let good. him in while you play the song? Sure. You guys just want to. Oh, my God. Suzanne's already at the bottom left of my screen, jumping around. Like She's a, warming up. Oh, yeah. The Limber dance collective. Up. Are you ready? Limber. Yeah. This There's is the dance collective. Feed. This is getting better and better. Yeah, Rachel. Oh, yeah, we have both dance a... collective. We just like to tell people it's like a, a natural dye thing. I think it's we not. have a chorus as well. A natural I want to start chorus. getting covers of Feedback Friday. More covers. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Also, hold on. Okay. I would just hit chat by mistake. And greetings, yes, from Hawaii. What okay. is in the house? Hawaii, oh, 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 oh. Early there. Oh, I, oh, oh, just a moment. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Sweetest song. Oh, mute yourselves too. So we don't, so we can hear this song fully. Here we go. Well, it's the end of the week. Now where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday. So come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We gotta present it that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to October, October 1st already. Yes. The temporal acceleration is happening. It really was just March. Believe me, it really was. Now it's October. We're also having that kind of mid-level panic, maybe holidays, maybe travel, maybe getting together. It's, yeah, here we are. Welcome, welcome. It's episode 71 of Feedback Friday. Feedback Friday is our show where Amy Dufo, who's Director of Communications and Sustainability, and me, Kathy Hattori, welcome incredible speakers, artists, growers, activists, natural dyers, 
oh my God, historians, just anybody who has an interest in color, natural dyes. And Diane Becker, when we're done, I want to know what you're working on. And uh, we are so excited today to welcome Rachel McHenry. Rachel's a, a very wonderful, dear friend from Toronto, Canada, and she has been working in the field of craft development and uh, empowerment uh, internationally for quite a while. She also is an amazing artist in her own right um, and has some incredible products that we are hoping to bring to Botanical Colors because they're just beautiful, beautiful threads that she's been um, developing and trims that she's been developing for the past few years. So Rachel is going to talk about her work in developing ideas and products focused on natural dyeing, uh, including collections developed with Ajrak dyers in Pakistan, um, a natural dye research facility in uh, India, and a forest-based community production in uh, Northeastern India, Assam in Assam. Her talk will look at the connections between cloth, color, community, and the land. And before we start, I'd just like to say thank you, everyone. Um, your support, your enthusiasm, your participation, the community that this creates has just been totally invaluable to us, has really helped us through some kind of ups and downs of not only the pandemic, but life itself. So we, we couldn't do it without you. And we really want to thank you for joining us and being with us today. Um, just for a little housekeeping, Amy's going to be our moderator on this chat. So we'd like you to remain muted until we open it up uh, at the very end for hello and goodbye. Um, the chat will be where you put your questions and she'll open that up at the end of Rachel's presentation. So you can ask questions of Rachel and Amy will moderate that. Uh, like I said, we'll have everybody muted uh, for the presentation, but we'll open it later. This call is being recorded. You heard that voice. And um, that means that this will be available for you to review later on um, this week when Amy posts it on our website. So with no further ado, just want to welcome Rachel. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to hear what you're going to talk about. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you both Kathy and Amy for inviting me to take part in Feedback Friday. Um, I think it's been a wonderful initiative to have this going through the pandemic and uh, really has helped us all, uh, all of us who are interested in this area to have this amazing forum for exchanging ideas around all the different aspects of natural dyeing. So thanks so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and uh, put up my presentation and we'll get started with that. It just takes a second. Okay. So since we're going to be talking about connections between land and people and following on Canada's first national day for truth and reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge that Toronto, where I'm speaking to you from, is on the dish with one spoon territory. And the dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee that binds them to share the territory and to protect the land. And we're also in Treaty 13 territory signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I'd like to acknowledge the continuing presence and stewardship of this land by Indigenous peoples. Um, I'm a designer whose practice is focused around natural dyes. And I work through long-term relationships with communities around the world to sustain skills and knowledge while researching bioregional materials such as plant dyes and local plant fibers and developing this research into contemporary design collections as well as sharing this research with communities and with students. And I'm interested in developing ideas, relationships and products that are based on natural dyes and dyeing and working in balance with the natural world. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about. And the first aspect of what I do that I want to share with you is, um, is Botanica tinctoria. And this is a range of organic and naturally dyed materials that um, I've been developing over the last, I guess, seven years for makers and designers, for costumers, for people working in film and craft. And um, I wanted to create materials that would inspire people to make things and that would promote the beauty and the richly nuanced color of natural dyes. Um, I really um, like the idea of encouraging people to be creative and to broaden the scope of what's possible in design working with the natural dye spectrum. I'm always thinking about what kinds of materials would be unusual and interesting for creative people to use. So um, I'm always on the lookout and developing new kinds of um, materials for use. And just recently, we've been able to introduce a, a beautiful linen embroidery thread that's taken us a number of years to source and develop the colors for. So always on the lookout for new materials and thinking about ways that they could be transformed into inspiring materials. Um, all of the materials are sustainably um, produced. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And they can all be composted at the end of their useful life. So instead of creating waste that ends up in landfill, these materials provide valuable nutrients to the soil and um, they contribute to the well being of the natural world. Um, to produce these materials, I collaborate with BioDye India, and this is a natural dye research project and production facility that's located in central India. Um, it was founded by Dr. Bosco Enriquez and Anne Shankar. Um, Dr. Bosco is a, a biochemist and Anne Shankar was a textile historian. And their idea was to bring together contemporary ideas about sustainability, uh, along with the scientific method and information from the historical record, as well as looking at local knowledge to create high quality, stable, even and rich dye colors. So Dr. Bosco was able to kind of pull apart the natural dye um, process and understand what's happening in terms of chemistry at each, at each stage. And he was able to um, try and optimize each stage of production. So um, we have a, a palette of 14, um, I think, harmonious and luminous, beautiful colors. And we work with a lot of the classical natural dyes like madder, lac, and indigo, mordanting with alum, and working with natural tannins such as mirabellum and pomegranate skin. All the dyeing is carried out by hand um, using a closed loop dye system. So what that means is that the biodegradable waste from one part of the process becomes a useful resource in another part. Um, you can see in the right-hand image, the wastewater that's shooting out of the, the pipe there. All the wastewater is collected and um, in settling tanks and the natural um, materials in the wastewater are allowed to settle. And then that nitrogen rich water is used to irrigate the crops surrounding the dye works to grow the next generation of plants as well as food and, and medicinal plants. Um, and on the left hand image, you can see two of the um, uh, two men working in the mordanting process where they're passing the threads through tanks uh, with the mordant, uh, mordant bath in it. So um, all of these different elements of, of the dye process can be useful, the wastewater, for example, and um, there are other parts of the, the process that we can look at as well. Um, so you can see the, this is the land surrounding the dye works, unlike um, a chemical dye works, a synthetic dye works, where the land around the, um, the dye works is oftentimes dead land and the rivers are dead rivers. This is living, vibrant, productive land. And it's made that way through the materials that are produced during natural dyeing. So you can see on the left-hand image, there's a pile of compost. So they compost all of the dye wastes. And there are a couple of the settling tanks there that I mentioned as well. And then in the right-hand image, crops growing in the fields. And one of the things um, that they've discovered is that 
the alum that settles out of the mordant baths. Um, once the water is removed, they dry the paste that's left and there's an alum powder that's left. And that's a really good natural insect repellent. So they use that on the fields to repel pests from, from the food and um, dye crops. Um, Biodye is also working with local farmers to support the reintroduction of indigo farming and as well as growing natural dyes and focusing on regenerative farming practices that are good for the land and are, will support sustainable livelihoods. And um, indigo dyeing used to be uh, quite widespread in this region and for uh, various reasons uh, has died out. And so it it's, um, can be a really great um, sustainable crop in crop rotation for the farmers. And we're also working with uh, the sustainable gathering of dye materials with a number of local women's forest groups. So they gather leaves, fruits, byproducts, and regenerative stems from um, wild growing dye plants. And they are just gathering elements that won't kill the plant. So the plant continues to live and um, they can continue to harvest from it safely. And I think um, William talked about that in his talk, it was a while ago, but that's the same idea that uh, not over depleting your resources. And these women's groups manage the local forest resources. So in addition to maintaining and, um, and harvesting the dye plants, they also are gathering fallen wood for firewood and caring for the forest. So the materials um, are all made using methods that are sustainable for the land and for the people making and using them. And all the materials um, have a useful function after they're no longer useful as textiles, yeah, being composted for, um, for use um, in enriching the land. So this careful approach to dyeing um, creates rich, clear colors that are stable and long lasting. And we dye on organic materials, including organic cotton, airy silk, and linen, creating a wide range of embroidery threads, as well as um, trimmings like ribbons and lace and rickracks, um, a few fabrics like these linen fabrics shown on the left-hand side. And um, a new project that we've been working on has been to develop some patterns to show people what you can make with the materials as well. Um, and all different kinds of people use these materials. I work with a number of small businesses and independent fashion designers that use the materials in their collections and their products, as well as providing materials directly to all different kinds of makers across North America and Europe and the UK. And um, I also work with another wonderful initiative and uh, I've been really delighted and, and honored to work with Seven Weaves in Assam, India over the last couple of years. Um, supporting them in developing their business model. And um, from them, we're, we're now offering these beautiful hand spun and natural dyed airy silk threads. And these threads are reared, spun and dyed in forest dependent communities in these really juicy, luscious, light reflective colors. They're just gorgeous. Um, we're also going to be offering some of their plain weave fabrics shortly as well. So airy silk is a completely sustainable material, all produced from start to finish through indigenous knowledge systems and skills by communities living in balance with the natural world. So this material is very much about that connection between cloth, color, community, and the land. And um, this way, these, these ideas that we are um, now rediscovering, the ideas around circular systems where we don't produce waste, but we're looking at the whole life cycle of production, use and disposal. These are central to the way these indigenous communities function and have functioned for millennia. The people in the communities carefully manage their resources in common with community managed forests and pasture land, for example. And they don't overextend their use of their natural resources beyond the carrying capacity of the land. So the silkworms are reared in these small farmsteads on castor leaves, which are also grown there. And then after the moths have left the cocoons, the thread is spun by hand on drop spindles and it's dyed 
using forest gathered natural dyes. And all of these systems have been developed in a kind of symbiotic relationship between human beings and the natural world over thousands of years. And the image on the left is of uh, the mordanting process. And on the right, one of the artisans is preparing some of the gathered, uh, wild gathered dye stuffs. Um, and from this, uh, this source, we are working with um, the very beautiful Assam indigo. That's the Strobolanthus crucia. And that's a woodland shade plant. It thrives in indirect sunlight. So um, the co communities are planting this crop in forested areas where it has the shade of the forest trees. And um, the communities all work around regenerative farming practices. They're very uh, carefully monitoring and working with crop rotations and also looking at crop relationships so that um, one thing follows on another in a way that supports the land and enriches it. And uh, the communities work with this traditional fresh leaf indigo process for dyeing and produce a beautiful range of, of um, blues. There are lots of other forest gathered plants. Um, matter root comes from uh, the hills not far away. There's um, bamboo and rice hay, tea leaves. These are all used. Um, lac also is, is, comes from the hills in the, in the region. And um, the idea of forest care is embedded in the way the communities think about the forest and use the forest. So in addition to the sustainable harvesting of, of dye plants and medicinal plants from the area, they're also thinking about things like developing elephant corridors um, and how they can coexist with this really important animal that can also be highly destructive to their crops. So developing corridors and safe ways for the elephants to come down to the water at the river um, and so they can live in harmony with this very large and uh, imposing animal. And another is um, they, they're looking at ways to support the endangered gibbons that live in this, these forests through actually planting fruit trees that are the food of these gibbons so that they can create um, a good place for them to live. Um, there are many other dyes in the region. We're always on the lookout, researching um, old texts and working with the university and talking to elderly people to find out about different kinds of dyes, as well as um, plants with pharmaceutical properties. And um, recently we discovered that Simplicos grows in the region. So now we're figuring out how we can use that in dyeing. And Simplicos is a natural accumulator of alum. It's a plant. And so um, this would be a great step forward for us because then we'd be able to gather and use all aspects of the natural dye process from the land. So we're pretty excited about that. And these are some images of lac dyeing. And um, Kathy helped me in figuring out how to remove the resin from the raw lac. Uh, we were having a lot of trouble with that. Um, and now we're getting these beautiful clear colors from the lac. And um, in addition to the, the threads and dyes that um, I'm featuring here, Seven Weaves is also producing um, beautiful textile collections of handwoven cloth for slow fashion and for high-end couture. And um, they, just before the pandemic hit, they had the opportunity to show these at, um, in Paris at the big international textile fair and had very, very good response to them. Um, we'll see what happens as we move through this, this uh, tricky and difficult time, how that all develops, but very beautiful uh, textile collections. Sorry, I'm just losing my arrows for a second there. Um, so recently we've been working on introducing a series of patterns. These are how-to patterns featuring different handwork techniques to help makers explore what can be made with these naturally dyed materials. And the first set of patterns features Canadian designers and artists, 
And the idea is to promote creativity and to support people in making things themselves, because I think it's so important for people to make things, whatever it is, stitching, sewing, dyeing, drawing, um, that's a really uh, important part of who we are. And this wrapped blouse is designed by Jennifer Laflamme, who's an artist who creates exquisite one-off clothing pieces using natural dyes. And she's highly influenced by her own Japanese heritage. And this one is inspired by wrapped farmer's clothing. For this design, she's developed a simple but beautiful hand ruching technique based on traditional shibori stitching. And that's what creates this elegant and elastic wrist edge that you can see in the image. And um, this is a collection designed by Ruth Wickray Mary Surya, featuring the indigo plant on a series of table linens, including a couple of sizes of napkins and napkin rings and this rather stellar and gigantic table runner. And the three sizes of the indigo embroidery designs can equally be used for, for visible mending or stitched onto a bag or used to personalize a found shirt. So all of the patterns are flexible in how you might want to use them. Um, this piece is by Amanda McIver, who's a wonderful artist who creates large scale embroidery installations. And I'd really encourage you to check out her work. Very, very gorgeous. And in this pattern, she's developed a flexible series of designs based on drawings of prairie smoke plant specimens that she was researching at the Wisconsin State Herbarium. The designs use the couching technique and they can be placed around a simple collar as shown here, or they could be worked over a stain or a hole for mending or used to rejuvenate an old garment. And um, this pattern is a, a series of um, pieced mats that focus on this hand stitch uh, surfaces and creating these simple um, patchwork techniques. So the other part of my journey with natural dyes um, is handwork studio. And this is a design studio um, where we work at the intersection of craft culture, commerce, and research. And uh, the studio um, is a two-person operation. This is my wonderful friend and partner, Manira Amin, who uh, is the co-founder of Handwork. And we provide consultancy services for artisan groups, governments, trade facilitation offices, and others doing the kind of work that Kathy mentioned in the introduction. And so we've worked in projects um, in Peru and Haiti, in Chile, in Nepal and India and Pakistan for clients like the government of Canada and for UNESCO. And in addition to that, we also produce our own very small special collection of handmade pieces, mostly produced with uh, artisan communities located along the banks of the Indus River in Pakistan. So over the past three years, we've been working in Sindh in Pakistan with communities that traditionally produce Ajrak textiles. And these are a complex multi-layered traditional block printed textile made using natural dyes, primarily indigo and madder. And in this process, the sun, plants, mud, and the river are all part of the process of Ajrak making, the printing and the dyeing. And many of the communities are located um, near important Sufi shrines, which also is an in cultural influence. And that's what we're seeing in this beautiful image here. The Adrak printers work with a natural lime resist that's applied by hand using hand carved wooden blocks. And this is a method that requires a lot of skill and a very finely attuned eye as all the printing is carried out without any kind of registration tools, but by hand and we work on local cotton cutter fabrics for our products. Blocks are carved from the local acacia trees and the wood is first buried in the earth to age it and then it's hand carved using chisels and soaked in oil before being used for printing. And all the carving, um, it can only be carried out by hand. And it's, it's really a rapidly disappearing art. A lot of the block carvers are quite elderly and it's not something that is um, very attractive to younger people. So we're trying to keep our block carvers 
going. These are a few um, of our blocks. And in traditional abstract designs, four blocks are used to create a highly complex design. And it's built up in layers of resists, mordants, dyeing, and over dyeing. So there can be up to 20 steps in creating a traditional pattern. In our designs, we're working more simply with geometric shapes and using various repeats and playing with different scale to, to create a positive and negative space conversation. Um, we want to work with a kind of sense of organic simplicity and show the beauty of the dye on the cloth. And this is the dye, uh, indigo dye setup. Um, the artisans in these communities are working with natural indigo. They also use alizarin from matter root, and um, they work with iron vinegar for gray, and a number of plants such as the kisuful, as, which is a yellow blossom that gives a gold color. And of course, working with mirabellum um, as a tannin. And in this region, there used to be a lot of indigo grown, and it was connected to local agricultural systems um, around crop rotation and provided the dyes necessary for the traditional adjac printers. As there's been less demand for natural dyes and for adrec printing, farmers stopped growing indigo. So we're starting to look at working on a long-term project with other partners in the region to reintroduce indigo growing. And it's part of our broader interest as a studio in how natural dyeing fits into culture and the land and how it's connected to people and place. And as many of you know, indigo dyeing depends on a lot of specialized knowledge in creating and caring for the vat and a lot of skill in carrying out the dyeing. And the dye is built up over time in layers. Um, a lot of this information is passed through the generations. It's oral information in these communities that's not written down, but passed on from, from one generation to the next. And the indigo dyer may taste the vat to test it, as well as depending on touch, eye and smell to ascertain what the vat needs to produce its beautiful, rich blue dye. And for the work we do, the lime resist printed textiles are dyed in layers to obtain a rich, deep blue. After the dyed layers of indigo are dried outside in the sun, the cloth is taken down to the river to be washed, removing the lime resist, oxygenating the cloth, and revealing the block printed patterns. And as in many parts of the world, in these rural areas of Sindh, there's a flow of young people away from rural areas and into urban areas in search of work. So we're really um, interested in trying to support a, a more stable rural economy in this area. And we're part of providing more meaningful local employment. So allowing the artisans to remain on their land and to retain their traditional cultural knowledge. We're working to sustain traditional skills and working against knowledge loss. Yeah, these, these skills just disappear overnight because they're passed along from person to person. So there's a 5,000 year history of indigo dyeing along the banks of the Indus River, dating back to the ancient Indus Valley civilizations. And we're hoping we're doing our small part to keep them alive. Um, the rapid changes with the push for modernization in, uh, across this area make it difficult for traditional artisans to retain their way of life. So um, during COVID in particular, this community was really uh, badly hit because of the lockdowns. Um, they, they need to work in order to have money coming in. So we did, um, we were able to, uh, set up a funding campaign and able to send food into the communities during COVID. So we designed to make use of the tremendous skill that the printers have in creating specifically structured prints rather than designing with continuous repeats. Um, we work with areas of pattern that are balanced by areas of natural color where the eye can rest. So the collection includes cushions as well as table linens and accessories and printed on this heavy cotton cutter or on a more delicate cotton lawn fabric. So we work with the printer's amazing abilities to engineer prints and their understanding of surface. 
This is a very large scarf printed on a very lightweight cotton lawn in natural indigo. So initially we worked um, with indigo and with the iron gray color, but in our newest collections, we focused on a couple of new colors. One is this beautiful gold that's obtained from the Kisuful blossom. And we're also working with a soft terracotta that's derived from madder. And both of these colors reflect the natural colors of the local landscape and the earth and the mud buildings that are found in this region of Sindh. So we only produce a very limited amount of these totally handmade and hand dyed textiles. And um, we, we work with a number of boutiques, small boutiques in the US and Canada and the UK. And we also have them available on our own web shop. Web shop. Um, but it is very limited production, you can imagine with the, the communities we're working with. It's um, small scale. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so very much for coming along. And um, we'd like to invite you to visit our sites. And we're offering a special 20% discount across both shops from October 1st through 8th with the discount code botanical. Rachel, that was so amazing. The, to see the, the patterns that they're making, you know, they're so, they're so crisp and, and precise. It was really impressive. Can I just ask a quick, quick question? Is the resist, is the resist mud colored? It's a, it's, it's, like um, when it's, printed, it's kind of a brownish color and as it dries, it gets whiter. Okay. I was just it's reading it as a, mud, it, it's a mud uh -huh. base with lime mixed into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. And the alkali of the lime provides a resist against the natural dyes. Uh-huh. Fantastic. I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Amy, you can start asking away. Oh, great. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Rachel. I put Rachel's links to all three sites that she talked about. And I also put the discount uh, amount with the code in the chat. Thank so you. if you guys, yeah. And I'll, I'll put it again a couple in, in there a couple of times, but we're just gonna kick it off. So Lisa Purdy's asking, I uh, don't know if I missed it, but curious how you started on this journey and how you created these relationships with growers and dyers in India and Pakistan. Um, yeah, I've been working in, in this area, working with artisans for a really long time, but I've actually been natural dyeing since I was a child. And uh, I learned to natural, uh, do natural dyeing with my mother. Um, so I've always been interested in, in this area long before it became popular. And um, when I did my graduate work, uh, I based my work around working with women's groups in Nepal. And at that time, um, the school I was studying at, they, they didn't think natural dyes had any future. They said to me, you know, your project's lovely, but natural dyes are never going to go anywhere. So why don't you reproduce those natural dye colors with synthetic dyes? And I said, no, I really want to use natural dyes. They said, no, 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 we just can't. It's too messy. We can't have that in the studio. So I had to actually do my project, which was about natural dyeing. Um, but I had to produce the samples using synthetic dyes, which was kind of strange. Um, but I've been working with, um, with artisan groups around the world for about 30 years. So I've had a long time to develop different kinds of relationships with people in different parts of the world. Um, some of the people I've worked with, uh, I've known for, for really a long time, and others are newer acquaintances. Um, sometimes amazing people reach out to you on, on social media. And that's actually how I got connected with Seven Weaves was through Instagram. Um, other times it's involved a lot of research and travel and, and so different kinds of relationships, but I've, I've been doing this sort of work for a long time. Um, and um, I'm, I was drawn to natural dyes um, because of my interests in, you know, maintaining this beautiful planet we live on. And, um, living here in balance with, with everything, the bounty we have in nature. I like how all three of those sites, like after I was, I had been checking them out, all three of them, how they, they're all kind of tailored towards something 
sort of specific about what you just said to kind of um, the artisans themselves, the designers. So there's different access points, which I yeah. think is really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. People are doing all different kinds of work. That's what's so interesting. Yeah. Okay. Francis is asking, can you please elaborate on the resist ingredients or um, slash method? Um, yeah. Well, uh, following on, on the chat I had with Kathy at the beginning of this, um, it is, it's earth, it's mud, and um, it has lime mixed in with it and water to make a paste. And then that paste is used as the printing medium. So the, the block is actually um, touched into the, uh, instead of touching it into ink, it's touched into the resist. And then that's what the printer is printing out on the cloth. And then that's allowed to dry in the sun. So it gets nice and hard. And then it's immersed in the various, um, the vats, the indigo vat or the, the uh, natural dye vats. And then um, after dyeing, it's dried again. And when it's the, the cloth is fully dried, it's then taken down to the river and um, agitated in the river. And that's when the, the resist actually uh, comes off. So it, it seems to stick on really well through the dye process. You wouldn't think it would, but it does. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, kind of? Yeah, yeah it answers it, yep. Let's see, Julia Rose. Uh, any plans to host or develop textile tourism in these areas one day when we can all travel again? <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Um, it's something that um, the people who are, are um, running Seven Weaves are thinking about. They're thinking about how they could um, work with the community to have homestays where people could come and then learn about the whole process of uh, airy silk production and natural dyeing and also learn about how the communities manage their natural resources. So I think that would be super exciting and that would be an amazing experience. And they're looking at that for, you know, in a number of years when, if and when we're all able to move around again. Mm -hmm. And Margarita, I did not skip your question on, on purpose. So I'm just gonna, I'll connect you two later because I know you, you wanna talk with Rachel about your project. Okay, um, Mariana where, is asking where in, the cent where in central India is the first project you talked about? It's, um, it, it's in a rural area of Maharashtra, right in the smack in the middle of India. There's no uh, sort of identifiable town or city nearby that I could tell you. It's just, it's like just in the middle of the countryside. Amy's asking, would love to hear about what your Chile projects are and their location. Ooh. Yeah, um, Manira and I worked on a, a project for the government of Canada in Chile, and we worked with a group, uh, a community of Ayamara weavers. Um, and um, because of the political history of Chile, there's been a lot of erosion of, of knowledge around weaving. And um, the, the current government was very interested in starting to revive some of that traditional skill. So we, um, we actually worked with the artisans um, around designing and not, not trying to introduce new designs, but trying to sort of empower them to, to explore their own design heritage and um, talking about how to work with color and pattern and motif. And um, a lot of the artisans brought old textiles that they had had hidden away from their grandparents. Um, and we, we looked at ways of um, reintroducing some of those older forms. And then we also worked with them to develop a collection that was, um, it was slated for export. So looking at the North American market and developing textiles. Um, they we're mostly doing dyeing with synthetic dyes, um, but again, the natural dyes were something we talked about and, and talked about how to uh, sort of regain some of that knowledge. And some of the artisans were working with natural dyeing as well. Okay. Somebody else had asked about um, Chile as well, and also thanking you for not listening to your professors. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm also an educator and um, yep. I highly support not listening to your professors if they're telling you the wrong <laughs> I'll endorse that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Kim's asking, would you consider doing naturally dyed silk ribbon? Um, I did, I have thought about it. There are a lot of uh, small scale craft dyers producing naturally dyed silk ribbon already. I think um, the wedding area is a really big uh, market for silk ribbons and, and also um, flowers and floral arrangements. And I've kind of tried not to do things that a lot of other people are doing. Um, but if I found the right kind of silk ribbon and that I thought was something no one else was doing, sure, I would, I would be happy to do that. I'm always, uh, every time I go and work with people, I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for what they're making and what might be useful and interesting to incorporate into th those collections. Okay. Um, ooh. Deanna is asking, which, okay, I won't say anything. I'll let you answer that. I would love to read more about how amateur indie natural dyers could evolve our practical processes to be more like your closed loop. Do you know of any pointers on this specifically? Ha, huh, what a good question. Um, I think it's kind of a matter of thinking through your process and um, trying to make changes where you can, yeah? We, we don't have control over all the systems. Like we're working with oftentimes with um, water systems that we have no control over and waste systems we have no control over. But you can um, look at each step of what you do and see if there are changes you can make. Like maybe composting your waste dye materials would be an easy first step. You know, saving the the pomegranate skins or the avocado pits that you're using and then adding those into your compost, they'll make gorgeous compost. And then you could use that to grow whatever you grow in your garden, food or flowers or dye plants. That's already just a small step. Um, and then just considering the spent dye baths as a valuable resource, that's really nitrogen enriched water. And once you sieve out the solid materials, you have um, a really, really valuable water resource there. And again, if you have some way to use that, um, to return that to the earth in a useful way, um, it's better served going into water plants and support regeneration rather than putting it into your urban wastewater system. So mm -hmm. I think just things like that, if you can, if, if you're in a position um, where you can think through some of those, those uh, steps and see what you can do. Yeah. That makes sense for you. Yeah. Um, are these various communities, sorry, Julia Rose is asking, are these various communities able to be in contact with each other, possibly with your facilitation? Could be an interesting natural resource brain swap symposium among artisans and dyers. Yeah, it's something we've talked about. Um, in working with Seven Weaves, they have a lot of really interesting ideas for the future about creating networks between artisans around the world. Um, you know, we've even talked about all the similarities there are in the way of life um, between uh, people in Peru, for example, and people in Assam. So even though they're in huge, they live within hugely different cultures and in different um, areas of the world, there's so many similarities in how they think about the land and how they use the natural resources from the land. And we've talked about the idea of artisan exchanges. Yeah. Um, different kinds of meetings and sharing of information between indigenous artisans. So it's a long-term and ambitious project. And I hope someday we can make that happen. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear more about that and be part of it. Mm -hmm. You're on. Okay. Uh, Joan, 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 Joan. Uh, I'm trying to introduce natural dyeing in the university where I teach also in Canada. Okay. Um, we should be in touch. Yeah, you should be. Uh, so much resistance, but I will use this presentation in my fight. She puts it in quotes. Yes. There's a uh, lots of people who are reaching out from universities to Kathy and I right now that want to mm -hmm incorporate, you know, some of the things that we're doing. I know a lot of Feedback Fridays, I'm getting screenshots from universities all over the world that Feedback Friday is being used as part of curriculum, which has been yep. hilarious. But um, maybe talk talk more about it, like what your experience is, Rachel. Yeah, um, I, you know, I pushed for including natural dyeing in curriculum um, since I've started teaching. 
And when I started teaching, I was able to bring it in um, as a special workshop, either as a, you know, a visiting artist over a couple of days or um, as a end of term special workshop or summer school. And, um, and there was room for it in that kind of uh, a space, if we th think of it as like an auxiliary kind of teaching. And as time has gone on and there's more of an understanding of, um, of climate change, of environmentalism and of the impact that we're having on the natural world, um, there's more in the news about things like fast fashion and the uh, highly polluting impacts that fast fashion has, there's more openness and understanding among administrators who are the ones we usually are kind of bumping up against when we want to introduce new curriculum um, around why natural dyeing might be a, a useful tool in teaching. And I think now um, many more places are able to incorporate natural dyeing as part of the main curriculum. And there may be teachers here who are, um, who are, are attending this lecture today who might wanna add to that. Um, but I know it is a fight. It is a fight. And I think now we have more um, support to, to explain to people why it's important. It's not only all the connections it has with uh, climate change and, and the natural world, but there's also the cultural importance and the cultural, um, uh, it's really like an almost an emergency to save this knowledge. And um, I think you can tie this into uh, a lot of universities interests right now around decolonizing their curriculum and um, about uh, providing information from different viewpoints um, and looking at pre-colonial history as the source of a lot of um, really important knowledge. So those may be tools that are useful for people who are trying to uh, introduce this to, to, into their curriculum. Um, I think you just answered some of Kim's questions, which I mean, the different spins you can give uh, on natural dyes when, when teaching. She, Kim's asking about, have you ever worked with elementary or high school students? Um, her organization, Let's Talk Science, is doing a project on the environmental impact of the clothing industry and our clothing choices, which is exciting. Yeah, and there's so different much- Different groups work. to talk to, elementary and then high school. Absolutely. Oh there's so much good work going on um, in elementary and secondary education and and using these kinds of um, approaches to science is so exciting because you can you can learn um, so much. There's uh, there's all the the interconnections between all the elements of the natural world. There's the chemistry of natural dyeing. There's you know so many different layers of of things that can be um, uh, illustrated and also it's fun to do. So it really is a way to engage with students, I think. I haven't done a lot of work um, with those age groups. I've done some work in high schools um, and some work with kids, but not a lot. Most of my work has been in post-secondary, but I do know there's really amazing stuff going on. And I think it's a, a great tool for learning both in the sciences and in the arts. Yeah, I've never seen more of an impact in talking with people in, like in my own professional career in sustainable fashion, the natural dyes has been the most incredible way to connect with people through math, through science, through art, through history. Yeah, so many culture, great ways literature, music, it's everywhere. Yep. yep. And, and in the chat, people are talking about that too, like um, different ways that they've connected with students as professors or former professors. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's so much that gives um, tremendous engagement for people. Yeah, They're, these are things that we all like, we live with and we know, yeah, as textile. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's everywhere and it's it's everywhere in your life, really. So it's, it's a wonderful tool for learning. Yeah. Uh, Kim Taylor, I'm gonna give you, she said, would love to see connections to local Canadian plants for dyes. Special shout out to Anita Cazola doing the Botanical Reclamation Project please check that out. Um, Anita did a, a really beautiful Feedback Friday and even covered the Feedback Friday song, which was pretty impressive. It was gorgeous. She's been doing a lot of incredible, like great work. Her newsletter is wonderful. So check out the Botanical Reclamation Project that's in Guelph. Guelph, Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Anita's so. fabulous. So you should check out her work. And then um, in terms of uh, Canadian dyes, um, there, 
I don't know if I'm going to remember her name properly. So I, I maybe I'll wait and give it to you after Amy. But there is an amazing woman. Maybe I can find her quickly um, in Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, who's doing great work with growing natural dyes and also providing um, um, online teaching. Yes, Mel Sweetnam. That's it. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> And um, there's also a, a farmer here in Ontario who has started a natural dye farm. And she, that's uh, Becky Portier, and she is connected with Upper Canada Fiber Shed. So those are two interesting things happening here in Canada. Yeah, that Can Upper Canada Fiber Shed's doing a lot of cool work. Yeah, them. absolutely. All right, well, guess what? It's 12.56 and done. time has run out. Rachel, see how fast it goes? And Thank you Kathy, everyone for all those God. fabulous questions. And I'm really um, delighted to know there's so many other educators here and that there's so much discussion going on around how we can share knowledge with our students and what students can do with that knowledge. So mm -hmm. it's great to see that you're all here. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel, thank you. Oh, thank you, you guys. That was such a nourishing conversation. And thank you everybody, because you guys were all like asking these amazing questions. But I do have one final question. All right. In the Pakistani Ajrak tradition, what is the role of women? Ah, okay. So in the images you saw, the men were printing and you saw the men were down at the river. Yeah, um, within those communities, uh, the women are largely sort of inside the family compound. Mm -hmm. And so the, the whole family is engaged in the whole, in the process. Um, but women are, first of all, not comfortable having their photographs taken. Sure. And it's not acceptable. And yep. um, they are not out in the world as much. Yep. But women also, um, they do a lot of the, the after washing down in the river. Mm -hmm. um, they do a lot of the pre-washing before the printing happens. They uh, assist also in the mixing the resist uh, pastes, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in this community, the men are the dyers. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. So the whole family is engaged in all the different parts of it, but um, yeah, it's it, in the- The, the more public roles are typically male roles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well in Assam, the women are, it's a very different culture and mm -hmm. women do everything. Yeah. yeah, So the women are the dye experts and yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you, Rachel. Yeah. All right. Oh. Thank yeah, this was fantastic. I really super appreciate like this breadth and depth of knowledge and just kind of, oh, it's, it's great. I, I normally don't take tons of notes, but I have nearly two thirds of a page of just ideas that you were sparking as you were talking. Um, that was fantastic. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about a few reminders and then the folks that we have uh, coming up. Um, next week is moving mom week for both me and Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to have a feedback Friday. We're going to be, uh, yeah, we're going to be at Target, I'm sure, or somewhere. I'm not going to be at Target. You put and tables. <laughs> I haven't been in Target in a long, long time. So uh, anyway, just a couple of reminders. One is that um, we have a few uh, spots remaining for both Kim Eichler Mesmer, who is doing the um, the stitch shibori using machine stitching. It, uh, I learned it as katano shibori and it's super beautiful because it will create these sort of interesting motifs that you can layer different kinds of other shibori techniques and or other colors on. Um, super sophisticated, interesting, interesting fabric. So if you're, if you are um, of any inclination to think about this. Um, we're going to close this class, I think, on over the weekend. So don't hesitate there. And also Samantha Varone. Samantha is doing this kind of um, intuitive rust dyeing, go gather things and figure out what they're going to make and look really deeply into your urban or your context of where you are and see where the rust is, because it's there. Uh, it's kind of like mushroom hunting you know you don't see mushrooms until you finally look learn to look for where they might be and then all of a sudden they're everywhere um 
let's see. Oh, also, the seaweed books came back from uh, Ninka. So if you have been interested in it, we now have them in stock. We are restocking on Jane Calendar. And so both of those books are available for you. Um, and that beautiful fructose indigo vat dyed um, 40s muslin cotton that we have from 1111 is still on sale. And uh, don't do not delay on that one. That that's beautiful stuff. So that's out there in the shop. And um, we are going to return. What is the week? Let's see. Next week is the eighth, after... seven fifteenth. Yep. Wow. October 15th. Hopefully halfway through October. Oh halfway through October. We're staying away from pumpkin spice, but we are having Shannon Algier and Glennis Cotton from Stone Barn Center in New York joining us on the 15th. Um, Shannon and Glennis are both artists and activists, and they're doing amazing work connecting food, fiber, and natural dyes on the farm. They had an amazing um, online conference last year with their young farmers that we were part of, Amy and I were part of, along with other natural dyers. And it was just fantastic to see like this hunger for information and connection that uh, these young food raisers were having with each other. It was incredible. So I'm um, very, very excited to have them join us. They'll be co-presenting their work and getting us to open our minds again. We get to do it twice. <laughs> and how all of these areas are connected and to complement each other. So don't miss that. Don't miss out on Rachel's um, <laughs> sale of amazing things on her site. And uh, what else do we have? Is that it? Well, We're gonna yes, open again, it up I... and say- Yes. Hello. Say hello and goodbye. Yes. Oh, the shirt behind me. Oh, this is a oh. this is a robe from Benin that is. Um, I asked Abu Bakar about it. He said probably someone who is pretty wealthy would have worn this. And it it has it's a tunic, and it has like a uh, it has both a slit in the front and the back hem, so that you could horseback ride wearing it so it was it was either a hunter or a fairly wealthy benign important person and <laughs> yeah but it's it's all strip cloth it's i love this thing rachel's got some pretty fine stuff behind her yeah as well oh i also put rachel's uh the link to that a couple people were asking of course they were about what you were wearing rachel and I did put the I put the link in there too. Oh yes, that beautiful. That, oh, is such a great. It's block printed. You said right. Yeah. Okay. It's right. time for everybody to say hello Make and goodbye. Noise. Thank hello. Rachel. Hello. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank hello. you, Rachel. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Christine. Bye. 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 Oh, hi, Debbie. Hi. 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 I like your hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, slept, oh, I was saying I slept off. on it funny. And it's all like it's just it doing fun. its own thing. Yeah. It's fun. All right. A fine okay. hairdo for a fine woman. <laughs> hey, Amy, I am gonna like run away. So do you okay. want to be host? Okay, fine. Bye. I'm gonna make you host. Oh, okay. Should we oh, stop? Miss, yeah, let me stop the recording one moment. I'm gonna leave too. So okay, bye, bye guys. Bye, bye, Rachel. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Rachel, that was amazing. Oh, thank you so much. There was thank so you. Inform much information. I am gonna watch that this presentation over and over because there's so much to learn. Oh, thank you. You did wonderful.